Welcome back to my channel and in this video we discuss a very important topic in the shoulder complex biomechanics that is the static and dynamic stabilization of the shoulder. So far we have studied individual joints and now we move on to stabilization mechanism which are seen in the shoulder joint and in this video we purely focus on static stabilization and in upcoming video we will move on to the dynamic stabilization of the shoulder joint. Right? So let us look into the static stabilization of shoulder joint. and dynamic stabilization of the shoulder is very important with respect to your examination point of view you can expect a long answer or long essay from this session either static or static and dynamic they can ask you but it is relatively one of the most easiest aspect to study in the shoulder complex because you can study this as a story like a story in fact your static stabilization so let us begin that story of static stabilization first of all you get a term like a static stabilization why there is a need of static stabilization you should remember that okay and since it is a long answer question you need to re, um, you need to start up with a general introduction about the shoulder joint so how do you start you need to mention that the glenohumeral joint is a ball and socket type of joint Right, the glenohumeral joint is a ball and socket type of joint which is formed between what is articulation? The uh, humeral head articulates with the glenoid fossa. Right now, what is the peculiarity of that articulation? The humeral head is very large as compared to the glenoid fossa, which makes the joint highly incongruent. That's something that you need to arrive at the conclusion that is incongruency of the joint. It's not just that the glenoid uh, fossa is very small and humeral head is very large that makes the humeral, glenohumeral joint incongruent. But at the same time, the uh, glenohumeral joint or shoulder joint is a joint which has compromised its stability for the factor of mobility. We, am, we have seen the range of motion possible in the glenohumeral joint and it was very large 120 120 90 80 etc so to achieve such a greater range of motion the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint has compromised its stability so these two factors one is a large humeral head and the second factor which is because of the compromisation of the stability for mobility the glenohumeral joint is an incongruent one so in after your general introduction you need to arrive at the conclusion the glenohumeral joint is an incongruent joint right now such an incongruent joint how can it be stabilized can the bony components can the glenoid fossa the peculiarities of the glenoid fossa or the associated um, uh, labrum can such structures uh, provide the stabilization in fact no so the bony component alone cannot produce this sort of stabilization so there is need of some mechanism which can provide the stabilization and we are in search of that mechanism which is that mechanism so first we saw that the glenohumeral joint is an incongruent one you should remember static and dynamic stabilization applies to the glenohumeral joint in particular and not to the entire shoulder complex okay so we are came to conclusion that it is an incongruent joint now here we move on to the matter so in resting position that is static stabilization means a shoulder joint is at rest or it is not moving it is an uh, it is not moving so such a condition uh, we can say that when arm is at side when, I'm, when my arm is right arm is at side it's not moving so this is known as the static phase of the shoulder so in such a phase okay in static phase you can just imagine for example uh, let me draw a humeral head over here and uh, glenoid fossa over here okay 
Now just imagine this situation. This is a static phase. There is no movement happening. Okay. So at this phase, when shoulder is resting on like this, there is a single force which is universal and applies to every part of the body and every human being. Which is that force? The gravity. Yes. Such a universal force known as gravity is always acting downwards. So, at resting stage, when all, when this arm is at rest, no movement is happening, even in that such a phase, the gravity always acts downwards. It pulls the arm downwards. So, we got a force which can create a problem. That force is known as the gravity. So, the gravity acts downwards always, even at rest. So, when arm is at side, the gravitational force exerts a pull downwards which is always present and it can produce if this force is not balanced just imagine if this is force is not balanced what can it cause it can pull the humeral head downward for example it can pull the humeral head downwards like this okay it can pull the humeral head downwards like this that is it can produce an inferior translation at the glenohumeral humeral joint it can produce an inferior translation at the glenohumeral joint. For example, when arm is at side, my arm is at side, even at this point, gravity is acting down. And there are some structures which is balancing that. We are going to discover that. If these structures are absent, definitely my hand will go down. Definitely there will be an inferior translation or subluxation at the glenohumeral joint. Right now, we got the force which can create the problem. The second one is, the first point is the joint is inconcurrent. Second point is that uh, the gravitational force always act downwards, producing an inferior translation or capable of producing an inferior translation. Now the question, who is going to balance this gravitational force? Who can balance this force? We are not uh, facing a problem of subluxation or translation at the glenohumeral joint. For example, when my arm is left arm is at side, when your arm is at side, you are not seeing that there is a translation or there is a subluxation happening. Why? Who is going to do that mechanism? Or in fact, the first answer that comes to our mind is maybe the muscles, okay? The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, the deltoid, the rotator cuff muscles. Uh, you might think so, but that's not the answer. The answer is, you know it, the muscles are mostly electrically silent when arm is at side. We know that the body always go for the method of energy conservation. When arm is at side, you think that this, all these muscles are active, continuously active at this phase. It can, uh, it can produce a need of, it can create a need of greater energy, greater ATV breakdown, greater uh, energy wastage. So body won't go for that. Definitely these muscles are going to be electrically silent. If muscles are electrically silent, just think on which can be the other structures. What can be other structures which can produce this uh, uh, force that can be gravitational force. There comes something that we studied in the glenohumeral ligaments. What is that? The rotator interval capsule. You might have studied it very well. Rotator interval capsule. What is rotator interval capsule? This is a group of three components. What are that? You know that. That is the superior capsule. Superior capsule of the glenohumeral joint, right? Superior glenohumeral ligament, superior glenohumeral ligament, and the third one it is the coracohumeral ligament. Coracohumeral ligament. So these three structures together forms the rotator interval capsule. So we see that the muscles are not active during this phase, and we find out that there is this structure is known as the rotator interval capsule or superior capsule, superior glenohumeral ligament and coracohumeral ligament which are taut, which produce some tension in this resting position. So when arm is outside, muscles are inactive. You need to write the next point that is the muscles are inactive. Now, rotator interval capsule is active. It produces the necessary force. 
to balance the gravitational torque downwards. So you can see that the rotator interval capsule will be acting in this direction, right? It will be acting in this direction. That is the direction of fat fibers. Now we get two force components. That is a force of rotator interval capsule, RIC in this direction and gravitational force in this direction. Now we need to resolve that force, which we know that by the parallelogram method, if we resolve that forces, we get a resultant. We get a resultant for the two forces, which is acting into the Glenoid fossa. This is the resultant of that forces. You, if you don't know how to do the parallelogram methods of uh, uh, force component resolution. Just let me know in the comment section because we'll do a video on that. How to resolve force vectors in parallelogram method or in concurrent force systems, etc. Okay, so just for your knowledge, now there is a force acting downwards like this. There is a force which is acting downwards like this. There is another force acting this manner. You construct a parallelogram in two direction and the diagonal of it gives the resultant. So this is the resultant. Okay, where do you see with that resultant? That resultant is directed into the lower part of glenoid fossa. Of course, this should be like this, into the lower part of glenoid fossa. So, when there is two forces acting like this, the resultant of that force, we see that it is acting into the glenoid fossa. That means this resultant will, this resultant will compress the humeral head into the glenoid fossa. This resultant will compress the glenoid head in humeral head into the glenoid fossa and will prevent the inferior translation. So we got the force which is doing the work here. That is the resultant force of rotator interval capsule and the gravitational force. This is acting down into the glenoid fossa and compress the humeral head tells that no, no, you should not get displaced. Clear? That is the force which is providing the resistance against inferior translation. What sort of force is that? Is it an active force or a passive force? Definitely it is a passive force. So you should mention that it is a passive stabilization. Static stabilization is a passive stabilization because there is no muscles that are active. The force is provided by the passive structures which includes rotator interval capsule, the superior glenohumeral ligament and coracohumeral ligament. No need to get confused because all the structures which I mentioned over here that is the rotator interval capsule, um, the coracohumeral ligament, uh, the superior capsule and glenohumeral ligament all are acting in this direction itself. If you look at the component of that, all of them are acting into this. So we can continue or com comprise them into a single force that is the force of rotator interval capsule. See that is the essence of static stabilization, which is a stabilization achieved by your, which one? The rotator interval capsule. But that is not enough. The stabilization by this rotator interval capsule is not enough to maintain the arm weight. You know that how heavy your arm can be. Your arm is so heavy, this rotator interval capsule cannot produce it cannot make the uh, arm in a stabilized position. So the first force or first component is RIC. So there is a need of some additional factors which can reinforce the structures. For example, we, we have, know that uh, a joint is stabilized by capsule. Capsule is reinforced by capsular ligament. Then the joint is again stabilized by the ligament and then again by the muscles. So similar to that, you need some additional structures. The first one in that is the negative intra-articular pressure in the capsule. You know that the glenohumeral capsule is a large one and covers the glenohumeral joint. For example, this is the head and this is the uh, which one glenoid fossa. We have a capsule which is seen in the anterior aspect. We have a capsule which is seen in the posterior, superior or aspect. So this capsule of the glenohumeral joint is an airtight one. Okay, this capsule of the glenohumeral joint is an airtight one. What happens when something is airtight? they can produce a vacuum which can pull the humeral head. For example, 
we have a capsule over here which is airtight this capsule will pull the humeral head like this so it itself will stabilize the humeral head like this so the capsule is having a negative intraarticular pressure that negative intraarticular pressure will pull the humeral head upwards and provides a stabilization to the glenohumeral head so the capsule of the glenohumeral joint negative intraarticular pressure you should write the capsule of the glenohumeral joint is an airtight one it is a sealed one okay so that airtight chamber will produce a negative intraarticular pressure negative pressure which act as a vacuum that sucks or that pulls the human hand like this you might have uh, seen that vacuum um, uh, something vacuum stickers and vacuum devices which you uh, just pull on push on to the or place on the glasses etc car glass and other uh, window and mirrors etc you can see that and you cannot remove that if there is a vacuum is vacuum is placed on that you have to slowly take out that uh, vacuum then the device will come out similar to that the humor if this is the humor again this vacuum will pull the humor head in such a manner so that is the negative intraarticular pressure in the glenohumeral capsule and third one that you have to remember or think about is another factor that is the inclination or orientation of glenoid fossa what is that yes just imagine in this situation this is the glenoid fossa and this is the humeral head you can see that this is the normal resting position there is every chance that the humeral head can displace downwards because this cavity is very small not like what you see in the acetabulum now imagine a situation anatomically in your arm the glenoid fossa is somewhat tilted upwards you can see that when it is slightly tilted this is a normal position right when this position humeral head can translate inferiorly but if it is slightly tilted upwards can you see what happens the humeral head is a bit more stabilized because the fossa itself is pushed upwards the fossa itself is pushed upwards like this so the head can be more stabilized so orientation or inclination of the glenoid fossa is another factor so in some patients we can see that some persons you can see that anatomically glenoid fossa is slightly tilted upwards so there are the advantage in some others due to the shoulder biomechanics shoulder movements the for example the upward rotation of the scapula if the scapula is slightly upward rotated this can produce increased stability see when it is upward rotated the inclination of the fossa changes and head is better stabilized than in this position if it is downward rotated like this there can be a greater chances of uh, this being displaced off but that is not happening so three scenarios which you have to remember one is the rotator in the capsule which is the primary one these are additional or uh, supplementing the head function of rotator interval capsule that is a negative intraarticular pressure and inclination of the or orientation of the glenoid fossa so this is the stabilization mechanism in static phase okay now you should remember static phase can be uh, one there can be a one more similar scenario in the static phase for example you are holding a suitcase in your arm and you are just not moving like this that is also a static scenario you have a 10 kg weight or 20 kg weight suitcase in your hand when or you have a weight cuff in your hand it is been a loaded arm still it is at side there is no movement can the rotator in double capsule can the intraarticular pressure or the inclination of the glenoid fossa help or produce that stabilization no that is a different scenario here the arm is loaded even though it is in the static phase in such a time one another structure comes into action can you tell that not all the muscles comes into action only one single person that is your supraspinatus that is the supraspinatus produce some additional forces which are required all these structures are active along with that the supraspinatus produce the additional force that is necessary only if the arm is at uh, rest and loaded if the arm is at rest itself there is no supraspinatus going to act, be active but when it is loaded the supraspinatus produce some force which is needed to balance the additional weight that we hang in the arm so supraspinatus is the additional force you may have to write at the end if the arm is loaded 
okay if the arm is loaded or if a weight cuff is applied to the arm weight is applied to the arm the supraspinatus provide the stabilization provided by ric negative intraarticular pressure and inclination of the glenoid fossa is not sufficient to provide the stabilization so you need the help of one additional structure which is provided by the supraspinatus it provides the additional force that is required okay you can understand the significance of supraspinatus because uh, just imagine a situation like a stroke patient or a brain injury patient you have a functional loss of the rotator cuff muscle or the shoulder muscles muscles are so weak and uh, one of the most serious problem that you face in your rehabilitation scenario is the subluxation of the shoulder in fact you don't you don't have to do anything you don't have to pull the arm but if the arm is not stabilized or if you don't apply any sort of additional structures like splints you can see that in a stroke patient who might additionally have some swelling in the arm swelling act as an additional for additional weight definitely the arm will get the subluxed slowly slowly eventually with one or two weeks or even with the first week itself we can see that there is in fact a one finger or two finger subluxation that is happened that has happened in the shoulder joint and that is one of the very difficult aspect of rehabilitation because you have to strengthen that muscle and get it back so the best strategy is that you have to forethink that one that there is a chance of uh, subluxation and just apply the splints or uh, place the arm in proper position so that uh, it is not going to be subluxed or avoid the uh, dragging of the hand or advise the bystanders that uh, don't pull the patient with arm uh, so because all the muscles are actually paralyzed especially your supraspinatus so such greater role is the supraspinatus a very small paralysis of the supraspinatus can even pull the arm considerably in the inferior translation now actually supraspinatus is only inactive why rotating diaphragm capsule negative intraarticular pressure orientation are still there what is the problem why can't these structures provide the stabilization? That is because the supraspinatus is paralyzed or the muscles are paralyzed and uh, there is a constant uh, dragging force, dragging force, dragging force. So what happens? These are all connective tissues. And what is the properties of connective tissue? They can get, uh, they can move into an elastic region. Do you remember the stress strain curve which we studied? They can move into the elastic region, but if they are continuously dragged on, it moves to plastic region. What happens if this goes for plastic region? The property of the connective tissue is being lost. So, when there is a paralysis of supraspinatus, when the arm is lowered, eventually the paralysis on the supraspinatus affects the rotator in the work capsule and this structure moves to the plastic region plastic region okay from the elasticity it moves to the plastic region and once it moves to the plastic region definitely the stabilization is lost and you get the inferior translation so that is the story of uh, static stabilization you just have to remember the starting of the story why do we need a stabilization we need a stabilization because it is incongruent you have to write about that then you have to write who is the main player the main player in this is the gravitational force who is producing all the problems here you just have to remember that now who acts against that that is the rotator interval capsule how it acts okay the negative intraarticular pressure how it acts the inclination of orientation of glenoid fossa which are the additional players okay the additional structures or the things that reinforce the RIC and finally who can act when there is a problem when there is an additional requirement that is a supraspinatus if you mention all this in a beautiful manner you master the rotator cuffs, uh, sorry the static stabilization of the shoulder thing now we need to move on to the dynamic stabilization in next session which is a bit more complex because there is the deltoid involvement there is the supraspinatus involvement there is other rotator cuffs involvement there is the biceps brachii long head involvement but we'll do that also in the simplified manner until then stay tuned and if you like the video as always i tell Click the like button and kindly subscribe to our channel.